you can enjoy singing that song when you're growing up as a kid. I mean, remember that song, maybe it was kind of special to you. Well, one of the things for me is whenever I hear that song, it, it causes me to think about the fact that Jesus, he, he really stepped out of heaven and he stripped himself of all of his glory and all of his honor and all of his prestige to come and to be born in a manger, really showing us, just being born in the lowest of the lowest places, really showing us that no one is too low for the grace of God. And it's really a powerful truth, but there's a, there's a phrase that is repeated over and over again in that carol, in that song, that I want us to focus on this morning, and it's the phrase, the little Lord Jesus. Now, let me just say this, because it would be a huge disservice to us if we just focused on the little part, okay? Because Jesus is so much more than just, you know, the dear little six-pound, eight-ounce baby Jesus in his fleece diaper and his manger, okay? He's, he's so much more than that. God has so much more than he intends for us to understand from that truth, okay? So this morning, we're not going to focus on the size of the baby as much as I want us to focus on the Lordship of Christ. And so if you're taking notes and you're following along your version live, let me give you my key thought for today. It's simply this. Jesus is, and I might say always will be, Lord. Jesus is Lord. In fact, it's interesting, when you study the New Testament, you, you go back, you see that in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as Lord 740 times. 740 times that the New Testament references him as Lord. In fact, when you go and you look at, at the gospel that is responsible for recording the birth of Christ, the gospel of Luke, we see that right in the beginning of the story, right in the announcement of his birth, Jesus is referred to as Lord. Luke chapter 2, let me show you what I'm talking about. If you have your Bibles, you, you can turn to Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. Here's kind of the context, okay? You're probably familiar with it. You have the shepherds that are out in their field, watching over their sheep at night, right? And the angel of the Lord appears to them, and here's what the angel says, verse 10. Do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is what? Would you say with me? He is, he is Christ the Lord. See, right there at the very beginning of the story, it's established that Christ has come, that, that he's the Savior of the world, and that he is the Lord of all. He, he is and will always be Lord. But that got me thinking this week. Well, what does that truth mean for us? What does that truth mean for, for our everyday life? If, if you're married, what does that mean for your marriage? If you're dating someone, well, what does that mean for your dating relationship? If you're doing what most people are doing right now, running out and trying to get all your Christmas shopping done, and you're buying gifts for this great aunt and, and, and that grandmother and all these things, you know, well, what, what does it mean for Christ to be Lord? What does it mean to make him Lord of our lives? What does that mean? Well, that phrase Lord in Luke chapter 2, the phrase that is, or the word that is translated, excuse me, in the Greek is the word uh, kurios. And here's what it means. It means one who has supreme authority. It means controller, or very literally, it means Lord. When we read that in the text that Jesus is Lord, it's saying that he's the one who has supreme authority. He's the one who's in control of everything. He's the one who's Lord. Now, I know right off the bat, some of you are going to take issue with the idea of Christ being Lord, right? Because if, if he's Lord of your life or supposed to be Lord of your life, then he's going to have a little bit of competition from you because you want to be in control, right? If you want to be the one who's in control of everything. Now, here's what I'm going to say. In my life, I am so thankful that I don't have control issues at all. I'm not a control freak whatsoever. As long as everyone does what I want them to do and everything happens the way that I want it to happen, we're fine, right? I mean, seriously, like, like I have some issues, okay? I mean, when I'm driving in a car, it's difficult sometimes for me to be the passenger in a car because nobody drives right. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about, right? And at home, I, I'm the one who like fights for control of the remote, right? My, my daughter Madison and I, we kind of have this saga going back and forth of who gets to control the remote. So let me just say this to you in case you ever stop by my house and you grab the remote to my TV, and I walk in the room, just put it down, and walk away, and no one will get hurt, right? The, the, the reality is, I, I have some control issues, but chances are pretty good, many of you do as well. And in fact, just, just for fun, let, let's kind of test this out, this theory of mine, all right? How, how many of you are the type of people that you have a certain structure and a certain order that you like your life to go in, your day to go in, and so you are list makers. Let, let me see your hands. Be honest. 
All the list makers in the house, raise them high, raise them proud. Right? Now, how many of you get really upset, those of you that are list makers? How many of you get really upset when somebody jacks with your list? Right? Why? Because it's kind of a control thing, right? Some of you, you're already preparing for Christmas morning, right? And you're going through the, the scenario in your mind. Here's what's going to happen. My kids are going to get up and they're going to brush their hair and they're going to brush their teeth and they're going to come downstairs with smiles on their faces and there's not going to be any fighting and we're going to read Luke chapter 2 and the angels in heaven are going to sing and everything is going to be perfect. Well, let's be honest, right? We desire control. We fight for control. We want control. So here's the question. What does it mean then for Christ to be in control of our lives? What does it mean to make him the Lord of our lives? If I could get technical for just a moment, and I don't want to make anyone feel bad about what I'm about to say. But the reality is this. You and I do not make Christ Lord. You realize that, right? God made Christ Lord many, many years ago. All we really do is just surrender to what already is. We, we surrender to His authority, to, to His control, to His lordship. We, we, we just kind of surrender to what already is. And so here's what I want to do for the remainder of our time together. Let's talk about how we do that. How can we surrender to the lordship of Christ? Or how do we make Him Lord in that sense? But let me give you two thoughts. If you're taking notes or you're following along, you version live. Here, here's two different levels of surrender. Level number one would be what I call the partially surrendered life. The partially surrendered life. And, and the reality is this is where many of us live. This is where many of us camp out. Okay, we're, we're kind of here because the reality is far too many people live what I like to call kind of casual Christianity. Okay, that It's kind of cultural Christianity. We say that we believe in God but we actually live as if he doesn't exist. It's the partially surrendered life. Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 6, and here's what he says. He's talking to the wise and foolish builders, and here's what he says to the foolish builders, verse 46. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord? In other words, why, why do you give me lip service? I don't, I don't want lip service, I want life service. I don't want you to talk the talk. I want you to walk the walk, right? He's saying, to don't call me Lord if you're not going to do what I say. Well, why do you call me Lord if, if you're just going to pretend like I don't even exist? This isn't a game. Like, we need to get this thing right. And see, in our lives, it's kind of the same. Because so many times what happens is this. We say that Jesus is Lord, but then we are the ones who fight to maintain control. Right? We say that Jesus is Lord... But then we want to do whatever it is that we want to do. And so here's what happens, just kind of practically through, through our everyday life. When we kind of take God's word when we do that. We, we take God's word and, we, and maybe the Bible says this. It says, you know, we should pray for those who hurt us or we should bless those who persecute us, okay? And what we know that the Bible says that we should forgive those who come against us. But maybe we say, but wait a second. After what they did to me, there is no way that I will ever forgive them. I know the Bible says that, that, that Jesus is Lord and I should submit to Him and I should surrender this to Him and I should forgive. But you know what? Forget about that. Or maybe we say, you know what? I know my, my finances are supposed to be where we're honoring God. I'm supposed to surrender all my finances to Him. And the Bible says that I should give 10%. But it's 10%. Do you know how much money that is? I know the Bible says that I should do it and I should surrender. But you know what? Forget that. Or maybe it's time. You know what? I, I should surrender my time to the Lord. And, and, and the reality is I have such limited time. So, so here's what I'll do. I'll go to church on Sundays when it's not football season. Right? But I'm not going to surrender you know, my Thursdays or my Fridays or my Saturdays. I'm not going to give the other parts of my weekend to God because that's my time to party and, and hang out with my friends and do all the stuff that I want to do. I know the Bible says I should surrender my time, but I don't think so. Some of you are kind of like freaking out thinking I'm going to get struck by lightning because I just ripped up a Bible. But, but the reality is those are just some pages that I inserted in there, okay? Because I don't think I can do that. But at any rate, here's the point that I'm trying to make. All right? So many times in our lives, this is what we do. We rip up the truth of God every day by what we do or what we don't do. And Jesus is saying, listen, no, no. Don't call me Lord 
if you're not going to do what I want you to do. I, I'm not calling you to a partially surrendered life. I'm calling you to more than that. i kind of help you understand what I'm talking about. In your talk notes, I, I've written for you or recorded for you Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 from the PSD version. Here's what it says. You can help me out. It says, trust in the Lord with what? With, with some of your heart and lean on your what? On your own understanding. In some of your ways, acknowledge Him and you can make what? You can make your own path straight. Now, for those of you that are new with us, okay, that's not a real translation. All right, I just kind of made that up. The PSV doesn't actually... Uh, it's not true. It's a partially surrendered version, okay? I just kind of <laughs> made that up for you. All right, but, but here is the deal. Here's what we need to understand. Jesus is not a part-time Lord, so he doesn't want part-time followers. Now, that's better preaching than you're saying amen to, but I'm just going <laughs> to say it again, okay? J Jesus, he's not a part-time Savior, okay? He, he doesn't want part-time Followers, He wants us to surrender all of our lives to Him. He says, if you want to follow me, you need to take up your cross daily and follow me. Right? If you want to find your life, you need to lose your life. He's the one who's in control. He's the one that tells us what to do. He's the one that, that, that is, is this Lord over everything. We don't get to choose, well, I like this stuff, you know, because it keeps me out of hell. But then I want to do all this stuff, you know, whatever the is I want to do. Right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, you, you call me Lord, but then I need to be Lord. You need to do what I say. Now, that, that leads to a question that I hope that you will prayerfully consider this morning. And the question is simply this. What area in your life have you not surrendered to God? What area in your life are you refusing to surrender that you need to? For, for some of you, it looks like this. You say, you know, I, I trust God with all of these things. I've surrendered all these areas of my life except for my kids. Because by golly, I'm going to get my kids to do what I want them to do, when I want them to do it, how I want them to do it, and I'm going to control my kids. Or others of you are saying, you know, I know I'm dating this person that I probably shouldn't be dating. That they're not drawing me closer to God. They're actually pulling me away. But I love him. And I can change him. Right? I'm going to control that area of my life. The question is this. What areas in your life have you not surrendered to God that you need to? Because the reality is, every single one of us in this room have areas where we're only partially surrendered to God. But that's not where God wants us to live. Because I believe God wants us to live the fully surrendered life. He wants us to experience the fullness of relationship with Him by being fully surrendered. And what does that look like? Fully surrendered is not just a Christian on Sundays. F fully surrendered isn't just being a Christian when it's convenient. It it's the all in, a hold nothing back. My life does not belong to me. It belongs to him. That type of commitment. Here here's how the Apostle Paul talks about it. R Romans chapter 14 verse 7. He says this, For we do not live for what? We, we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. We, we live to what? We live to honor the Lord and, and so if we die, we die to honor the Lord. He goes on. So whether we live or die, we belong to who? The Lord. We belong to, to the Lord. This verse shows us very clearly that we are not our own. We belong to Him. When we surrender to His Lordship, we accept the, the gift of salvation that He has provided for us. We belong to Him. We are not our own. It's, it's kind of like this wedding ring that I wear. All right, I wear this ring because it... it it reminds me, it's a symbol of the covenant that I made to my wife almost 16 years ago. 16 years ago, I gave her the best ring that a 23-year-old could afford. Oh. Right? And I asked her to marry me. And we stood before God. And, and she gave her life to me. She pledged her life to me. And I pledged my life to her. You know, we, we gave our lives to each other. So I belong to her. And she belongs to me. And we belong to God. Okay? She's mine. Just gonna say for the record, she's mine, okay? And I know some of you are saying, don't give me all that mail, you know, she belongs to me, she's she's mine stuff. Listen, she's mine. If you touch her, I will kill you. Okay? You just need to know this. But but in a very similar or in the same way, I belong to her, okay? But let me ask you a question. Could I go out and do some crazy table dancing with a bunch of other young girls? 
Not so long. <laughs> because she's going to remind me that I belong to her right before she kills me. Right? <laughs> That's just how, how it's going to be because I belong to her and she belongs to me. Well, here's the deal. In a very similar way, when Christ shed his blood, when he died on the cross, he made available to us this free gift called salvation. The Bible talks about it like this. It says that we are, we, it is by grace that we have been saved through faith, and this not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. He, he provided this gift to us. And so in the moment when we said yes to that, see, it cost us nothing, but it cost him everything. And so when we said yes to that gift, when we received that, in that moment, we relinquished control of our lives to him. We no longer belong to us. We're not the controller. We're not the Lord. He is. Are, are you tracking with me? Okay, that's the reality. That's the truth. When we surrender to him, we became his. But here's where the fear comes in for me. I think too many times we have kind of a, a casual approach to that truth. We look at Jesus as, as the dear little baby in a manger, you know, with his little six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus in the manger. We, we were like, you know, he's, Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is my homeboy, right? You see the t-shirt, right? We look at him that way, but here's the reality. Jesus isn't just some baby in a manger. He's not just some guy who died on a cross in, for, your, for your life, okay? He is, the Bible says, the soon and coming, ruling and reigning, ultimate and supreme authority of the universe, okay? He's coming with a sword in his hand, and I'm telling you, I want to see that, but a bad tattoo down his leg that says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, okay? That's who he is. He's not just some, some guy that we go, oh, that's really nice. We have this little baby that we celebrate, and we can put his little figurine in our major scenes. He is Lord. So here's the deal. When we come to him, we don't get the opportunity to say, well, you're Lord, but I'm going to do whatever I want. Right? What we do is we surrender to his rule, to his reign, to his authority in our lives. If you are a Christian, let me just help you understand. You do not belong to yourself. You belong to him. This is what scripture says about it in Proverbs Chapter 3, the real version. Okay? Here's what it says. Trust in the Lord with how much? With, with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, say that word with me. In all your ways, what? Yeah. Acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. The, the Hebrew word there for acknowledge is the word yada. And, and here's what it means it means to know intimately. Like a husband and wife know each other, to know someone intimately. See, here's the deal. To know him is to love him. To love him is to trust him. To trust him is to surrender your whole life to him because he is the all-knowing, all-powerful, supreme, good, and gracious God. That, that, that's who he is. You understand that, right? He, he's not just some baby. Mind if I preach for a second? He's not just some baby in a manger somewhere, okay? He, he's not just some little cute figurine. He is the Son of God who came to this earth to do for you what you could not do for yourself. He came born of a virgin so that he did not inherit the sinful nature. He lived a perfect, sinless life, all with one intention, so he could go to a cross and die and pay the penalty of your sins and mine, be buried in the grave, but three days later rise again, offering us the gift of life and relationship with God. That's who he is. So powerful, all right, that we can't even look at him in all of his glory, in all of his holiness, and actually live. Right? I mean, we can't behold him. But here's the beauty of it: he's not just some powerful God that's far off somewhere. He didn't just kind of start this whole thing that we call earth and, and spin it on its axis and then walk away and be like, all right, you guys are on your own. Right? The Bible says that he came here. He desired a relationship with us. So he came in the form of Emmanuel, which means God with us. We'll talk about that more next week. But he came to establish a relationship with us. He, here's the deal. Jesus came so that you could see God, so that you could know God, so that you could relate to him. Because for God, it's all about relationship. 
God desires a relationship with you. And the only way that it can be made possible is if God sent God to be all that you need. Think about that. God sent himself. He sent his own son to make that possible. Some of you, you think it's about rules and regulations and it's about doing this or doing that. I'm telling you, it's not about that. We don't do those things to earn God's grace. We receive God's grace and then we do those things in response to what he's done for us. But that's me. It's God desires a relationship with us. In fact, Jesus was asked, what, what is the greatest commandment? What, what is the greatest thing that you can do? And here's how he responded. He responded with a relational command. If you know, you can say with me. He said, "What well, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Love the Lord with everything. That, that, that's not the partially surrendered life. That is a fully surrendered life. It's not, well, I'll pick these things that I like and, and, and I'll, I'll get rid of these things that I don't like. No, it's, it's because I know Him, because I love Him, because I trust Him, I willingly surrender all of my life to Him. See, well, salvation costs us nothing. It costs Christ everything. And so our only reasonable response to what He did for us is to give all of our lives to Him willingly. Now, with that said, and I don't want to bring any unnecessary fear where there doesn't need to be any, but with that said, the question has to be asked. If you are not surrendering all of your life to God, then do you really know Him? If you're not giving or you're not willing to give, do you, do you, do you really know Him for who He is? Because Jesus says what I would say are some of the most haunting words ever. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Here's what he says. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. In other words, not everyone who got the bumper sticker or the t-shirt, Jesus is Lord. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. <coughs> In our culture, it might be, you know, didn't I go to church when the Steelers weren't on? You know, did, didn't I give some, some money to, to some project that the church was doing? Did, didn't I maybe, maybe, didn't I get wet? Didn't I get baptized? And Jesus will say this, I'll have to tell them plainly. These are the words. I never knew you. I never knew you. See, here's the thing. There's a big difference between calling Jesus Lord and actually surrendering to his lordship. I'll say it again. Jesus is not a part-time lord. He doesn't want part-time followers. He offered us the greatest gift ever. The gift of salvation. And while it costs us nothing, it costs him everything. But all he asks in return is for us to respond the only reasonable way that we can. Which is to give all of our life to him. I, I'm yours, God. I surrender to you. I belong to you. You are in control. I trust you. I, I lean not on my own understanding or my own strength or my own power. I, I don't lean on my own ways. But in all of my ways, in every area of my life, I, I acknowledge you. I know you. Because I know you're the one who makes my path straight. So, so here's the beauty of the gospel. While we could not do anything to earn our way to God, God did everything that was needed to make us right with Him. And so all we do is simply respond to the gift that He has given us. And the perfect response is this. When you come to read the terms, when you, when you realize what He has saved you from, what He's forgiven you of, I, I don't need to go through a list, right, of, of all the mess-ups that we've made of our lives. I think, I think we all know that. I, I, I know it. I know what I've done. But when I think about what I have done and what he's done for me, my only response is to say, here's my life. Here's my life. See, the beauty of the gospel is that Christ loves you so much that he came and he died, was buried, rose again, 
all so that you can have life. God loves you so much that he sends one only son into this world for you. And, and here's the thing I love so much. Even when we place our faith in him, there are going to be times that we mess up. There's going to be times when we make mistakes. But, but here's the beauty of it. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning because great is his faithfulness. You know what that tells me? That when I make a, make a mistake or I stumble or I fall and I come back to him and I say, Jesus, it's me again. You know, the world's grew up. It's me. His response to me isn't, you pathetic moron. Right? His response is this, I love you. And he dusts me off puts me back on the right track. And I don't have to start from square one, I can start from where I, where I fell out of relationship or whatever with him. And I can begin new because his mercies are new every morning. And his faithfulness is great to us. See, Jesus isn't just the little Lord Jesus. He's not just the little baby in the manger. He is the Lord of all. He desires a relationship with you. And he made it possible by giving himself. Would you bow your hands with me?